Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Planetary Society's Google Hangout today. Uh, I'm joined, uh, will be in just a few seconds, by uh, Matt Kaplan, host of Planetary Radio and uh, media producer for the Planetary Society. I'm Bruce Betts, director of projects for the Planetary Society. And uh, we're hanging out today, and we'll be talking about Matt's uh, trip that he just got back from to the ALMA Observatory, the giant ALMA Observatory, the largest observatory in the world. Depending on how you measure things, it just got opened. Hi, Matt. Hey there. Can you hear me? I can hear you quite well. Good. Uh, later, later in the show, hopefully, we'll be joined by Robert Holmes, uh, asteroid tracker extraordinaire, who uh, ha operates his own observatory. He's basically an amateur, but uh, only only in title. He's got some amazing telescopes and turns in more asteroid tracking observations than just about any other observer in the world. Uh, we're having, <laughs> but because he's in the middle of Illinois, uh, we're having some technical difficulties as he tries to connect through a, a cell phone internet connection. So hopefully Bob will be dropping in on us. But in the meantime, we have plenty of fun and excitement from Matt. Uh, so let me point out a couple of logistical things, and then we'll, we'll get you fired up there, Matt. Uh, we've got, uh, you can ask questions, and you can do that three ways. One through the Google uh, Hangout interface, or you can, uh, or th uh, through the YouTube interface, or through tweeting and putting hashtag planetary live one word. And uh, you can get questions into us, and we'll try to take them as we get to them. Uh, and uh, there we go. Planetary.org is uh, our website, and we're about space exploration and exploring space. Speaking of exploring space, hey, Matt, I hear you went on a field trip. Where would you go? I uh, Let's see. Oh, Chile. I went to Chile. Uh, we had the uh, <clears throat> ALMA inauguration, ALMA, which is the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, uh, said to be the most ambitious at least uh, down here on the surface-based uh, astronomy project in the history of humankind. And it's easy to believe that when you uh, see the place. Uh, and it was very exciting. I had never been south of uh, Tijuana. So to go to uh, Santiago, Chile, which was the first stop on the trip, was uh, pretty darn exciting. And then even more exciting to go north from there with a whole bunch of great people, a whole bunch of terrific North American journalists uh, and our hosts from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory up to the Atacama Desert where Alma is located. Sorry, I'm muting while I'm poking with other buttons. Please. Ah, you don't need to do that. Uh, See this? Bear with me. It's my first Google Hangout that I've uh, run the, the tech side on. So so how'd it go? How you how you feeling after <laughs> your trip? I I have a little touch, as you know, of Pinochet's revenge. Uh, but I'm um, doing okay. Otherwise, it's well under control. There were some of us who uh, I think had uh, bad juice at the uh, second of the hotels that we stayed at. Uh well, that's exciting. We seem to have lost Matt. That would be less interesting. <laughs> Matt will be back in just a moment. Let me tell you a little bit about the Alma Observatory. Uh, beyond what he said. Indeed, it is uh, this massive international collaboration of radio telescopes ridiculously high up uh, at uh, 16,000 feet in American speak, so over five kilometers up. And uh, it's got, uh, uh, it basically it's getting above most of the atmosphere to get away particularly from water vapor so that there's transmission windows so they can see through and observe at wavelengths that otherwise you, you pretty much can't. Uh, you can do some millimeter wave from lower down, but you can do a lot more from that altitude, and uh, you cannot do um, uh, much in the far infrared or submillimeter, which is the other focus of the telescope. Uh, it's located in the Atacama Desert, but above most telescopes, though not all of them, there is a, a the Japanese uh, optical or infrared telescope being built at an even higher peak in that general area. Um, I suppose I should check in with Matt and uh, make sure he knows that, uh, that we can't hear him. Uh, Matt? <laughs> Matt, are you out there? Okay. 
All right, we'll just hope Matt figures this out and uh, reassembles himself and uh, gets uh, gets back in here. Let me give some other preview. Matt will tell us all about the Alma Observatory, uh, but let me tell you about our Shoemaker Neo Grant program, uh, which is uh, what Bob Holmes is a three-time winner of a Shoemaker Neo Grant. Neo being near-Earth objects, near-Earth asteroids, and the Planetary Society is quite committed to planetary defense, saving the world from asteroids. One of the way we, ways we do that is through a program we've been running for over 15 years now, named after planetary geologist Gene Shoemaker. And uh, we support amateur and also professional observers throughout the world. And uh, welcome back, Matt. Hello. I think I'm back. Is this working? Yes. There's my, there's my poor man's lower third. Thank you very much. There. <laughs> Everyone came back, came now yeah. after uh, watching me swim. Hi, Bob. In circles. Google Hangouts bringing you unreliable webcasts for, oh, I don't know, maybe a year now. <laughs> Bob, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, great. So we are live and going out, and actually what I will do, uh, Matt just dropped off, and uh, you weren't connected, so I was babbling on first about the gist of Alma, but let me finish since I was mid-sentence talking about Shoemaker Neo Grants uh, that we are supporting... Uh, amateurs and also professionals that in looking and particularly tracking asteroids. We'll talk about that later in the hour, but it's one thing to find them, but you need a lot of observations to know their orbits and know whether they're dangerous and going to hit Earth. And uh, Bob Holmes, who just joined us, is one of the world's uh, experts and uh, gathers tons of observations about that. Bob, if it's okay, we'll come back to you. You're welcome to hang on as is, or you can... Uh, mute uh, audio and video, or you can just hang out and and talk with us. And Matt, you're uh, fully fully on board now, right? I think I'm back. All right. So I was giving some introduction to Alma as uh, looking in the millimeter and particularly in the submillimeter where it you can't see through the atmosphere very well at all. So that's why they put it so ridiculously high up. Why don't you tell us more about the observatory and and details about it and what they do? Sure, and I'll share some great pictures, too. I don't know how far we got before Google decided that I shouldn't be part of this Hangout. Uh, but um, <laughs> I don't, I, I, it, it may have been personal. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Thank you, Sergey. Uh, we um, uh, flew into uh, Santiago and then met up with this huge group of North American journalists and made our way back up by plane to the Atacama Desert. And as you said, uh, you are at that point in a very dry place because it's really the moisture that you really want to get beyond with these big radio telescopes in this band of uh, frequencies of wavelengths. And so uh, the day after we got there, we all got on this beautiful bus in San Pedro de Atacama and drove about 45 minutes over to the uh, Alma property, which has been granted to it or made available by the Chilean government, which is a partner in the project. And you drive across this incredible desert. I mean, talk about magnificent desolation. The first place you actually reach that is of any meaning is the OSF, the Operation Support Facility, which is already at about 10,000 feet. But then you go, or we went on, to our little visit to the high site, the AOS, the Array Operations Site, and at that point, you're at 16,500 feet. So you're up above a great deal more of the atmosphere and of the, uh, the moisture that wouldn't interfere with this amazing array. Uh, and um, indeed, uh, at that height, when things are working well, uh, they're able to do incredible work. I mean, they started using ALMA when they only had 16 dishes up and running in the array, that's less than a fourth of the 66 dishes, which will eventually be there. They're at 57 now. But even with those 16 dishes, they did what was called research um, or uh, cycle zero. And uh, back in January, I was at the um, annual meeting of the uh, American Astronomical Society, and you had astronomers just, you know, their mouths dropping open with the data that they were able to get from this array, which was operating at less than a quarter, probably well under because of other refinements that are yet to be made, well under a quarter of, uh, of the kind of sensitivity uh, and resolution that it will eventually have. They have 
they're really just getting going there. I mean, you ain't seen nothing yet, is what we heard from several scientists. I've got some slides. You want to see some pictures? Oh, I can't hear you now. Yeah, there you are. sorry. I was m muted, so I didn't uh, interfere with you. Yes, Matt. Yes, we want to see slides. Please. Oh, I us. have slides. In fact, I've got video, too. If people want to check out my little... Uh, a collection of video clips which uh, people seem to be people who've seen it seem to be pretty entertained by go to planetary.org slash radio and click on the link to part one of our planetary radio coverage of my Alma adventure that's what it's called there and there are links to these slides that I'm going to show you and there is also a link to the video uh, all of this is up at planetary.org but let me turn on screen share here put it on full screen and uh, tell me if this is, uh, have you got a nice picture here of uh, this uh, Lady Gaga wannabe? I have a nice, only if she looks like you. <laughs> no, you should be looking at her now. Let me make sure, uh, I, I actually did go into screen share here. It did not. Let me try again. I mean, I have seen the resemblance before. <laughs> I know, I know. She's, her people have tried to sue me. Now we see it and it terrifies me. Okay. I'm still trying to get to uh, full screen. There she is. This is this terrific singer. They put on a little show for us when we were still in Santiago. There was an exhibit about radio astronomy in, of all places, a subway station in Santiago. And they brought up this woman in this amazing getup. I'll show you the next one. Gives you a little, little bit better picture of her and her uh, radio astronomy uh, headgear there. And she was great. She did a really good job. Okay, the next picture, avert your eyes if you're afraid of blood. But I had to include this. Oh, uh, dude. <laughs> this is what you get for trying to help unload the luggage in a non-OSHA-approved uh, bus at the uh, Santiago airport. But uh, I'm fine. I was fine. You know, head wounds, they bleed a lot. Here we are at the San Pedro de Atacama airport. And you can see already, it's a very barren place. There are a lot of areas of the Atacama where you simply don't see any plants. Uh, here are a few plants, and you do go through uh, some uh, ecosystems on the way. There are volcanoes everywhere. This, uh, Bruce, you've probably heard of this place. This is the Valley of the Moon, where they uh, test rovers and uh, do uh, astrobiology experiments and stuff like that. A little bit more of that. <laughs> now, just imagine... Uh, the rest of Matt's slides, and hopefully Matt will come back in just a minute. Uh, fortunately, we're uh, able to, instead of just having me talk, while well, Matt tries to figure out uh, why why Google dislikes him but not the rest of us, uh, maybe, uh, Bob, if you're on, let's uh, go ahead and, and start talking about you while, while things work out. Uh, Bob Holmes is the director of the Astronomical Research Institute in uh, Illinois, USA, and uh, he is one of the most prolific observers of near-Earth asteroids in the world. Uh, he's a three-time receiver of uh, the Shoemaker Neo grants from the Planetary Society. Uh, maybe you can tell us uh, first a little bit about uh, your observatory. Uh, yes, Bruce. Um, can you hear me okay there? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, we've got um, three operating telescopes right now, and um, the telescopes we're working with right now are a 24-inch, a 30-inch, and a 32-inch telescope. And um, all three of the telescopes are basically used for near-Earth object observations. We currently have, um, or nearly uh, completed, a 50-inch telescope, and it should be operational in about um, 30 to 45 days. Um, still have to get the mirror illuminized. We've done the uh, testing of the optical equipment, uh, the mirror, the primary mirror in the telescope itself, and everything checked out really good. So we're really looking forward to making observations with that new telescope. Um, the 32-inch telescopes are our main telescope that we do our operations with, and um, we've had really good success with that, um, observing near-Earth objects as faint as 23rd magnitude with it. Wow. Wow. I see Matt's back. That's <laughs> impressive. Hello, Bob. Sorry about that. Second time That's that okay. uh, Google has let me down here. I'll just uh, listen to you talk about Shoemaker Neo object, uh, finding and tracking Shoemaker Neos, or uh, Neo objects, like I have a few times in the past. Yeah, that'd be my suggestion. Why don't we uh, talk Shoemaker or talk Neo observations and uh, Bob, and then we'll we'll come back and uh, rejoin your your tour of the Atacama. 
Uh, so I, I actually have a, a question, kind of a background question, Bob, which is how you how you got into this and uh, got interested, and what what led to setting up this uh, amazing observatory facility of your own. Um, I just happened to go to a um, uh, a conference up at uh, Champaign University of Illinois, and while I was up there, I listened to uh, Robert Kirshner make a um, presentation up there on supernova, which I had had an interest in for a number of years. Uh, I had been out of astronomy about 20 years until 1999. I decided to uh, get back into it, bought a 16-inch um, Mead uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope, and that's kind of how I got started. And um, didn't really get interested in asteroids. It was all supernova stuff up until about 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, went into asteroids then, and uh, in 2006, uh, decided I would take an interest in near-Earth objects, and um, it really took off from there. Now, uh, maybe uh, to I'll I'll force you to brag. What are some of the amazing statistics of your observatory and your observations? Because they really are amazing in terms of uh, your uh, how many you log and submit to the Minor Planet Center so that we can track these objects. Well, just last year alone, um, we produced four, over fourteen thousand near Earth object observations last year, and. Um, that is um, easily double um, the number of observations done by any other observatory uh, in the world right now. And, um, and it's not that we're just doing a lot of them. Um, we're doing a, uh, a considerable number of uh, very faint observations. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, a, a sheer numbers here. We're talking about actually going faint. And, and we actually do um, the majority of, uh, or we do more faint observations than anybody else on the planet. I'm saying faint, fainter than 22nd magnitude. Yeah, and for those uh, not familiar with it, that's that's just ridiculously faint, <laughs> especially for uh, an operation that, that you've set up like that. Uh, let me maybe give a little background the way the, the near-Earth asteroid finding and tracking tends to work now, which is different than it was, say, 15 years ago. There are a handful of professional surveys, mostly funded by NASA, uh, Catalina Sky Survey, Linear out of MIT Lincoln Labs, now Pan Stars out of uh, Hawaii, that do most of the discoveries. That's what they're set up for. But the real challenge in recent years is in finding groups like Bob's that can do the follow-up. Because as I mentioned, if you if you know an object's out there, it doesn't do you any good unless you know whether it's dangerous to Earth. And the only way to get that is lots of observations. And these survey telescopes are focused on the finding, and you need people like uh, like Bob who can do the follow-up. And what's really great, and I know is really appreciated in the the rest of the community, is that uh, Astronomical Research Institute can go to such faint objects because the professional surveys are designed now, so they're finding faint objects, but they don't have the capacity to find and do enough follow-up. Is that a fair assessment of how the how the game works? Right. Um, and, and another major aspect is um, creating a very long arc so that you can find the object um, during the next opposition. And that's our big uh, challenge that we really are um, are pushing for is to make those arcs as long as possible so um, they're able to be recovered uh, relatively easily and, and not really have to struggle uh, sh shooting a lot of different fields trying to find something. Now you've also uh, started some characterization work, is that correct, in terms of uh, sp spectral observations? I know it's not your focus. But... Right. We've, yes, we've done rotation uh, curves as well this past year. And um, it's, it's not a major part of what we do because um, NASA really wants uh, astrometry right now. Um, so um, even though we've got a telescope, we were planning to kind of dedicate more towards uh, uh, asteroid light curves and, uh, well, I should say near-Earth object uh, light curves. Um, we really have kind of used that telescope instead of light curves um, to actually do astrometry because PanStars has come up with so many new discoveries that we're not even with three telescopes able to cover all of the uh, discoveries, fan stars, um, mm -hmm. we want us to confirm in a single night. So astrometry, just for definition purposes, is position on the precise precision, position on the sky, basically. 
uh, and light curves is tracking the brightness of the asteroid over time and from that you can extract things like rotation rate and spin rate and things like that. Uh, that, that a fair characterization of those two things, Bob? Yeah, that's right, Bruce. Um, exactly. And um, but, but the main focus NASA has asked us to do, though, is to really confirm these objects and uh, and follow them up, create a good uh, long arc on them. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Why don't, uh, maybe you can give us more detail on your telescopes and your buildings that you use and your software analysis and just how you carry out a process on a, a given night as well. Meanwhile, I'll try to dig up pictures uh, of uh, a little of your setup. Yes, the um, telescopes we work with, um, they're all prime focus instruments. They're um, fairly simple. Um, we use a roll-off roof observatory rather than a dome so that the uh, dome doesn't have to uh, track where the telescope's positioned in the sky. It alleviates one more um, thing that you have to keep track of. Um, we prefer a, a telescope we can just kind of uh, scan across the sky with and, and not have any uh, um, issues with um, coordinating where the, the dome slit is. And um, our field of view uh, isn't tremendously large, but then again, too, it's not small either. Uh, typically about a half degree is what our field of view is. We just completed um, putting a 30-inch telescope online, um, or back online, I should say, because it was an F6-8 uh, um, Cassegrain. And that particular telescope um, just wasn't working well. So we um, had a new primary mirror uh, put in that telescope. And it's now an F3, and we have a field of view of about 40 minutes square on that. Um, and um, that's using a, a relatively... Uh, uh, small uh, array camera. So um, that particular telescope is the one we've got a lot of promise for, for tracking down, sorry about that, uh, tracking down uh, objects in the future. And um, hang on a second, sorry. And um, the 30-inch um, telescope, uh, we were using it for uh, photometry. And um, after the uh, need to go to astronomy, we um, just decided to go ahead and um, uh, create that uh, new mirror for um, um, tracking down uh, objects with a good size field of view. So um, with all three telescopes operating, we can cover a good part of the sky and we use the 32 inch telescope um, primarily for fa our faint objects and then the other two telescopes are used um, for objects that are uh, fainter than about um, 20 first magnitude. Hang on just for a second. Sorry about that. You're popular, man. Meanwhile, let me uh, put up, uh, I guess not very large, but a picture of Bob with his 32-inch telescope, uh, which, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, it's not bigger than it is, but you get the idea that this is uh, serious hardware. And then let me pull up the... I guess the mount for the new telescope. Hang on just a second. There we go. So can you see that okay, Bob? And others? Yeah. And so uh, that particular telescope, that's the 50. Uh, that's a 50 inch telescope. Um, it stands about 23 feet tall. So it's, it's not a small telescope at all. Um, it weighs about three and a half tons. And um, we built that particular telescope from scratch. Um, it was not uh, done by um, professional construction. We did it all ourselves. Uh, you can see the primary, the primary mirror now, as you can see, um, it's uncoated. Uh, we've got the primary mirror out right now, ready to go to the uh, um, closing in uh, Oakie, Illinois, for uh, get the aluminizing uh, done on the mirror. And as soon as that's back in about three to four weeks, we'll put it back in the telescope and start our polar line and get the telescope operational um, for near-Earth object observations. Great. So uh, that so how big a crew of people do you have working with you doing this stuff? Well, it's myself um, <laughs> as far as <laughs> running the wondering. telescopes and doing the observations. And um, I do have uh, several people who help out um, 
running the astrometry on these objects. Um, basically, that's analysis of the uh, images so that you can um, put the um, object positions into uh, numbers uh, so that they can be submitted to the Minor Planet Center. And we use it, uh, Astrometrica as our primary tool for uh, extracting um, our measures of these near-Earth objects um, for submission to the Minor Planet Center. Uh, let's see, I've got some comments from online. Um, I guess we have from uh, Denny Hinky, what kind of scope and software are needed to do new observations uh, with a, done with a manual 12-inch Dobsonian? And I guess the question is what, what can one see with that? Um, are you asking me that question? Yes, I am Bruce. asking you that, Bob. Um, yeah, you know, um, that would be a really difficult um, tool to use as far as astrometry is concerned or photometry. Um, if you had a uh, equatorial platform underneath it, um, that would be um, a, a better option for um, using a Dobsonian. But primary Dobsonians are uh, visual telescopes and not necessarily one where you could put a CCD camera on it and... Um, actually make position uh, measurements with. Mm -hmm. Now you also do some uh, some educational work and I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about that. We have an extensive education public outreach program. It currently goes out to about 40 countries worldwide and over 1,500 students a year are using the um, images that we have uh, taken with our telescopes. Um, most of those cameras, I think um, two of the three telescopes right now, the um, Planetary Society has funded um, those particular cameras with their, uh, with their Planetary Society grants. And so those images that are being taken, we share those with students and teachers around the world. And they will make um, uh, observations and measurements right there in the classroom. And um, like I say, it's, it's in 40 countries around the world, so we've got, it's pretty extensive. I've got a network of, of teachers that help make this happen. It's not myself just doing it. Um, the Education Public Outreach Program takes a lot of people, and I've got some good people um, in charge of that. That's great. Uh, it's really a wonderful setup, and I know the Planetary Society, uh, which I guess I'm, I, I'm supposed to do station identification. This is the Planetary Society, the world's largest space interest group, and we're excited to uh, help out people like Bob doing observations to save the world and do uh, planetary defense and get the observations that are so incredibly needed to know what's out there, because we don't know what out, what's out there. To overstate the obvious, we can't protect ourselves from potential impact. Um, now, uh, how many, how much, this is a, obviously, this is an every clear night activity for you, Bob? Yes, it is. If it's at all clear, we're working. Um, last night we had uh, 20 plus mile per hour winds. And when you've got that kind of wind and you're not inside of a dome, it becomes a challenge to make observations. Um, you've got to sit there, diligently delete any images that are, um, that are poor quality. Um, you, you're not going to get uh, good results from your data if um, you've got a bunch of images that um, are um, have a lot of vi wind vibration in them. So um, some nights are real challenging. Last night was one of those nights, and, but uh, it's a good test to, of the telescope. Uh, if you can make observations in 20 plus mile per hour winds, um, then you know your scopes are doing their job. Yeah, that's impressive, uh, Matt. Matt, there, do you have any questions uh, or comments for Bob while you try to fight with Google? I'm enjoying the conversation here and I'm um, glad to be back once again. I think I may have solved the problem, by the way, because I was going out to the Flickr album where our pictures are. Uh, but Bob, anyway, it's, it's, it's just nice to see you. Um, because normally I can only hear you when you're on planetary radio. Um, can you say something about sort of the, the fraternity, the brotherhood of you astronomers who are in this search? And, you know, I know there's an element of competition involved, but you also have a lot of kinship. Um, yeah, in the area I'm in, it's not so much competition. I'm not in the discovery process. When you're just doing follow-up work, there's not, a, there's not that much competition. Um, we're all working together to achieve a, you know, a common goal. 
And um, yes, it's really great to um, work with a lot of the, the guys that are out there. Um, in particular, uh, I work with the other follow-up teams and uh, we communicate nightly as far as who's doing what observations of what uh, particular objects so that we're not following up and doing repeat stuff on the same night. And so we're communicating quite a bit throughout the night uh, just to let them know um, what's going on and, and what we're working on on a continual basis from sunset to daybreak. How, how often do you actually see each other in person? I assume almost all this interaction is virtual. It is. Um, the last conference I went to was a couple years ago in April, and so, um, and that was my first time to actually meet any of these people. And of course, I virtually met all of them at this particular conference in uh, Tucson, and um, it, it was a really good uh, opportunity. Once you get to put a, a face with a person um, or a, an email address, it, um, it it makes a big impact and uh, made some really good friends, and um, it, it's been fun. Great. I can't tell you, uh, Svi, in your follow-up, how many of the, uh, the Shoemaker Neo grant winners of the past, when they've made a discovery, usually in the next sentence is, and we had follow-up observations from Bob Holmes. Hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, do, I have done an awful lot of those. Last night, um, we confirmed, um, I believe it was 13 objects for the uh, major sky surveys and uh, pan stars had about half of those and um, and one of the faintest observations we've done in the last 24 hours is in the 22nd magnitude level actually there were two of them near 22nd magnitude that we followed up for pan stars and um, it's it's a big uh, challenge and it, it's a fun challenge that, that's a big part of it too if you're not having fun then you know sometimes what's it worth you know so right. yeah Good well, time. Great. I have a question from uh, from Derek uh, Smansky. Does Bob have a website associated with this project? I do, and my particular website is uh, so dash research dot org, um, and um, that will show you the telescopes and um, our operations um, that we uh, conduct these observations with. Great. And then, of course, we've got uh, information, I have to say, on the Planetary Society website, planetary.org. If you search Shoemaker Neo or uh, search Holmes, you will find uh, information and updates uh, we've had from Bob. We've got some new updates coming out soon. And you can get information about the program in general as well as the Planetary Society. Uh, well, I suppose we should uh, move. Let me just chat, do a quick check for questions. Oh, here's a good one from uh, YouTube from Mike Clark Mack. Any recommended resources for amateurs interested in looking for NEOs? For you, Bob. Um, yes. Um, one of the best things you can do is get connected with a, a group like uh, the Planetary Society where they can help uh, get you started in the right direction. It's It, it takes um, an effort um, where you've got someone you can mentor with to make something like this happen. Uh, most people can't just like take off and do it on their own and and uh, fly with it. But if you want to get started as quickly as possible, uh, connect with the with with the right groups. And uh, planetary societies is, is a good place to start. Great. Uh, how about uh, if you don't mind hanging on, Bob? We'll uh, go back to Matt and talk out a comma. And if we get more questions coming in for either of you, we'll check back with them in a few minutes. Sounds great. All right, Matt, back to you and your trip to Alma. All right, let's hope it, I hang in there this time. I think the problem may have been that I was going out to uh, Flickr, which is where we have all these um, uh, images for people to take a look at, the Planetary Society Flickr account. So I've put those on the hard drive here, and I'm going to see if I can start this uh, screen share once again and do a little... Uh, Go back to my little slideshow, since um, I'm sure people would rather look at these pictures than me. Uh, while, you, while you pull that up, let me mention that you've got uh, some write-ups on the Planetary Society website under Matt's uh, blogs. And on uh, your, your early Atacama diaries, you'll have some follow-up. And the latest Planetary Radio episode is all about your trip to uh, the Atacama. And I guess next week's will be also, right? Yes, far too much to uh, cram into one show. In fact, I'm going to have to leave a lot out no matter what. So I'm going to try and put some of the complete interviews up on the website. 
uh, where people can, you know, if they, you hear a snippet of somebody that you like on the radio show, you can uh, go there and hear much more. But okay. uh, particularly the video, I think, is, is really fun. It's about six minutes of great clips from so, Alma. So go to planetary.org slash radio, and then uh, you've got a link to the video from there, right, Matt? That's right. So are you looking at uh, some slides here now? Looking at your, yes, uh, if I'd stop talking. So I don't know where we were here before, but this is uh, on the way to the Alma site. I'll go back to it. Uh, and this is the Valley of the Moon, which, Bruce, you may be familiar with. Uh, they test uh, rovers here and um, uh, do uh, astrobiology experiments. So you drive out of San Pedro de Atacama, and finally you reach the, the vast reserve where uh, the Alma site is. And uh, this was a very special event there, so they uh, had all kinds of banners up. Uh, we got there for Media Day, and this is some of the international media, since it is a very international project. Um, and it, you are surrounded by volcanoes. That's grandfather. That's what the natives in the area call it. Here is uh, what kept us alive at the high site at 16,500 feet. This is in the bus on the way up to or about to leave for the high site. That's El Wotan. I'll go back to that. That's El Wotan, who really was given is given a lot of the credit for conceiving of a facility like Alma, and he's been working on this project for 30 years. And I'll let the slideshow keep going here. Now we're at the high site. Notice absolutely no vegetation, 16,500 feet up, and this is what you're looking at: the second highest human structure on Earth, uh, the highest being a train station in Tibet. There's the array in the background, uh, and i got to figure out how I can pause these, and it doesn't seem to want to let me do that, so let me see if I can do it this way. This might be a better way to go, even though you won't have quite as good a view. This is inside that second highest uh, structure on Earth, and this is the correlator. This is uh, the world's highest supercomputer, but it's more than that. It also is probably the most powerful single-purpose computer in the world at any altitude. And it's necessary because Alma Works is able to turn these 66 individual dishes into one gigantic dish through interferometry, which you know we don't have time to go into here. But it's all based on crunching just enormous amounts of information and that is done by the correlator and the correlator is doing a terrific job of getting us not just a signal from 66 dishes but from one dish which eventually will be as if it was one dish 16 kilometers across they're not quite at that level yet but they will be before too long this is uh, Alejandro Sanz he's they lead in uh, taking care of the correlator and really I wanted to include this picture because notice the tubes list, uh, leading into his nose he's got an oxygen backpack he's got tanks on his back and even with this at 16,500 feet they really have to plan any procedures very carefully because it's just way too dangerous uh, uh, to do anything that takes a, a great deal of thought at that kind of altitude. You make lots and lots of mistakes. And I was, I was taking hits off that oxygen bottle on a pretty regular basis. So here's one of the 12 meter dishes. And what's really interesting about these, well, there are many things, but one thing is that they were built in different countries. Basically, the Alma Consortium came up with uh, the specs and then they told Japan and they told Europe and they told the US okay go ahead and build dishes and each of the uh, groups each of the uh, areas on on earth that was building them took uh, somewhat different approaches for example the Japanese dishes have magnetic drives while the uh, US dishes have geared drives and, and yet they all work very very well now this really doesn't do these justice you have to see them moving in unison, doing their cosmic dance. And you can see that in the video that we have up on our website. Again, you, the, an easy way to get there is from planetary.org slash radio and the uh, Alma Adventure radio show. But it's also in the video section of our, our multimedia drop-down menu. So here they are, a few of the dishes in context with uh, Grandfather, the volcano in the background. It is an absolutely magnificent setting. In fact, you know, Buzz Aldrin's uh, term, magnificent desolation, uh, applies just as well here, if not better, than it did to the moon. Here is the really clever way that they've come up with to service the electronics inside the dish, mostly the front end electronics, 
uh, that are the first place that actually, the first equipment that actually detects that ever so tiny signal coming from uh, back across the stretch of the universe. They, they actually use these trucks that all of us have seen as, uh, you know, bringing our lunch on board the airplane that we're going to be flying on. It is exactly that. That's what they do. They, you know, ride the truck up with all the components and they do the work right there at the dish. Here is an incredible device. They built two of these. 28 wheels, these are the transporters. You'll see more of it in a moment. These are the, the critical vehicles that they pull up to a dish, pull the dish, individual dishes, up onto the back of this thing, and drag it to a different site. Because the whole idea of Alma is that it's reconfigurable. They build these concrete pads, and then they can move dishes among the different pads, drop it on the pad, plug in the fiber optics, and they've really got a very different sort of radio telescope ready to work. And that's, they transport That's amazing. It. So they, they actually move these using those transporters instead of like the VLA using railroad tracks? Exactly right. That's right. Uh, and, it, of course, it's much more flexible because these things don't have to stick to just that Y-shaped uh, train track at the VLA. They can go anywhere. And they haven't even begun to use some of the uh, pads that are set really far out. That's when they'll start getting that, you know, virtual dish that is 16 kilometers across. Now, here's the guy with the coolest job at Alma, I think. Notice that, that cool remote control he's holding. When he gets close to a dish with the transporter, he gets out of the cab, he picks up that remote control, and he drives the entire 28-wheel vehicle with this wireless remote control. It is the coolest thing on, in the world. That's and he, sweet. Did he let you drive? No, no. They, they tied me up. They tied me to a pole, actually, because I kept trying to get at it. But uh, you could tell that he knew. He said, yeah, yeah, I have a cool job. He knew. So here actually is a dish being pulled up this slanting rack onto the back of the transporter with all of us uh, reporters standing around it. There's some of our group. And uh, in that group, yes, I think they're both there, are uh, both uh, Nicole, the uh, noisy astronomer, and uh, Radio Astro Gal. Oh, no, I got uh, Yeah, Radio Astro Gal, Tanya, from the uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, our hosts up there. Uh, Nicole and I actually did a Google Hangout from there, and someday we got to get her on this one. We didn't, weren't quite able to pull that off today, but uh, some other time we'll uh, definitely return the favor. And so now we've moved inside, and it's inauguration day. Remember, I mentioned that front end. We're actually looking down into the cryostat, which contains the front end receivers, and each one of those little discs that you see is a separate receiver for a different wavelength. And this whole thing is evacuated, it's a vacuum, and then they basically run liquid helium around it because they have to bring it down to 4 degrees centigrade so that it can, you know, pick up those very faint signals coming from out there around the universe, which is not much above the ambient temperature of the universe itself. Uh, it wasn't all uh, fun and games, but a lot of it was. Uh, they had this great group of native musicians, and this woman was actually uh, one of the VIP guests, and she just got into the dance. So then we all moved into a big tent, and they put on the big inauguration show, and one of the surprises was we got this uh, from an American and a Canadian astronaut, a live welcome and congratulations on the Alma inauguration from the International Space Station. And I think this is the last one I have to show you. This is President Piñera of uh, Chile, who made just a wonderful speech, not just about ALMA and how proud uh, Chile is to host all these instruments. Do you know that like 60 to 70% of the world's biggest telescopes are now in Chile, in the Atacama, up in the high country there? Uh, he just made a terrific speech uh, about science. He basically said um, knowledge is not something to be afraid of. And, uh, man, I wish we had a few more political leaders in this country who were talking like that. So there is my uh, little slideshow. Again, much more at planetary.org, Bruce. And uh, here, I'll get back to my camera if this works. And uh, with any luck, you'll be, you'll be able to see me now. Hello. Yay. Oh, that's <laughs> such a relief after those ugly pictures. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 I know. It's nothing like looking at uh, the face for radio. <laughs> that's what we call him around here, folks. <laughs> no, that's what he calls himself. Uh, let's see, man. We got some uh, some some comments. First of all, I've I'll, I'll start with a, a question. How much? I'm amazed at how much they have 
that is actually at that high altitude? Do they? Uh, I assume they still have control rooms uh, at lower altitudes. Oh yeah. Where they do the day to day. Yeah, that's nobody sleeps at the high site. <laughs> it's you don't want to do that. I mean, I really needed that oxygen a couple of times. Um, people who work up there generally don't do more than a four-hour shift because you just can't hack it at that altitude. You'd think maybe you'd get acclimated. Well, not really. So what they, all of the major operations take place at the OSF, the Operations Support Facility, which is at a mere 10,000 feet, or what, about 3,000 uh, meters. And uh, it's much, much easier to survive down there. And there is a terrific control room down there, and that's where we spent most of our time uh, in the uh, couple of days we were at Alma. Uh, some uh, comments, questions uh, from Andrew Planet, who's also been putting up all sorts of helpful links. Would it be possible to have more oxy oxygenated, sealed, higher pressure working in living quarters high up in the atmosphere? Uh, it's like, like at Alma. It's an interesting question. I was told that when they were uh, fabricating, putting together the correlator, they actually did pipe oxygen into the rooms, and they can still do that. They can selectively run oxygen into some rooms, but that wasn't an operation when we were there. Pretty much all of the staff up there were wearing those backpacks with tanks and they had the tubes running up to their mm -hmm. noses. The rest of us just had those aerosol cans with the mask that we pressed over our faces. But, I mean, you can tell it's, it's not an inexpensive uh, or easy way to run a facility, but it's working. I mean, it's, it really was worth the trouble. Any idea how often they have to uh, reload the the cryostats, reload the liquid helium in there? You know, don't quote me, but I think I was told by uh, the guy that I hung out with, Skip Turkle, who is the just recently uh, retired head or the lead for the uh, fabrication or the design and fabrication of the front ends in North America and actually sent sort of heath kits to the other places uh, that were building these front ends. Uh, Skip said, I think that they go for about a year before they have to be taken down. Um, these liquid helium circuits are remarkably uh, stable now, and um, it, it's pretty much off-the-shelf technology nowadays, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. But how often do they have to refill? I don't know how long they have to refill, but I know that they have to sort of take the whole thing down. I think he said about once a year. Yeah, because they've got to do refilling more often, presumably, but still impressive. Uh, other things uh, from online, from Bill Campbell. Great facility, fantastic science awaits. Thanks for this, Matt. Uh, My pleasure. Also been posting some useful things, and I want to make sure I share with uh, Bob the... Uh, the comment from Andrew Planet, how fortunate humanity and all other species are in having people like Robert safeguarding the Earth. Thank you, Robert. Ain't that the well, truth? Thank you. <laughs> um, let, all right. Uh, just checking, but let's go back to, to you, Matt. Uh, you got any more tidbits for us? This seems like quite an amazing adventure. So are they, other than adding more telescopes, they are fully operational at this point. Well, uh, they would tell you not exactly because they still think that they can go a long ways in evolving the software that is so critical to making uh, an instrument like this work. Uh, and then once those nine additional dishes are up, as I said, they have to start moving them to those outer pads, which as I understand it, Bruce, you would know better than me, because they're going to have a much bigger aperture, they're going to get higher resolution. And it, it truly is incredible already what, what they're resolving. I mean, people should go to the NRAO ALMA site, and you can just Google it that way, and you will see some of the amazing work that has already been done. I mean, they are looking where optical telescopes just can't go, looking through the clouds that obscure stars that are being born. And you can actually see this happening now. Looking at protoplanetary disks, where you can see the gap in the disk where a planet you can't see the planet, but you can see where the planet has cleared the dust out of that disk. And then uh, they've al they're already announcing, they've, they've just uh, uh, come out with these press releases about uh, some of the earliest galaxies that formed in our universe. And that is one of the major targeted goals for uh, ALMA, to tell us about, you know, when did these huge structures start to form in our universe? And, 
And, you know, like I said, every scientist I spoke to said, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to be uh, just an amazing instrument for another 20 or 30 years. I think it emphasizes one of the key themes is that in order to study planets or the universe, space in general, we need to use lots of different wavelength bands. They all do something different for us. And the challenge with things like submillimeter is it's so affected in the atmosphere by water vapor. Some things you just, you, you have to go to space, but obviously they found a way to do it. And it all, it all pieces together. Uh, which reminds me to shamelessly plug my free introductory astronomy class that's online right now. Uh, you can go to planetary.org slash bets class, B-E-T-T-S class, and uh, get inf more information. But I'm teaching those lessons every week, and I, uh, I harp uh, relentlessly about the importance of all these different wavelength bands to understand, uh, understand space. Can I make just one other compliment, uh, a complimentary remark? Not only do you need an instrument instruments that can monitor many wavelengths. But, you know, we're in the era of big science, uh, whether you're talking about super colliders or big, big telescope arrays. This is a billion and a half dollar project. And each of these groups, Europe, East Asia, and the U.S. and Canada, wanted to build one of these. By putting their money together, we got a much greater instrument uh, than anybody could have built individually. And this is the project, the NSF, National Science Foundation, has put more money into this project than any other project they've ever done, about half a billion dollars. Uh, and it just shows what can be done in this kind of international consortium, you know, make science, not war. <laughs> I think this is uh, an interesting show that we've put together because we have you talking about one of the most expensive ground-based telescope facilities in history and Bob representing the pinnacle of the almost one-man operations and uh, still contributing valuably. The, the trick is to figure out what, pick the, the areas where you need uh, each of these. Uh, Bob, do you have any last uh, comments, thoughts, reflections, uh, things that you forgot to share or that we didn't ask about? No, but I really did enjoy the uh, radio telescope presentation by Matt. That was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a, it was quite a trip. Uh, yeah, good job, and um, uh, thanks for sharing. Let me just uh, I think tie us off so we we end out on time. Remember, we are the Planetary Society. You can find out more at planetary.org. Uh, if you like what we're doing, what we what we do here, you can do everything from uh, retweeting, plus one, thumbs up, or uh, take the next steps. And if you haven't already joined as members, uh, join us at planetary.org and uh, consider donating to our projects and the support we provide to uh, to people like Bob to, to help save the Earth and, and all our other projects try to involve people in space exploration, get them connected, just like we've done, uh, hopefully, here with today's uh, Google Hangout. Sorry for the technical glitches uh, we had along the way, but hopefully you enjoyed it and learned a lot. Matt, you got any last comments? I Just a correction. I think I called Skip Turkle. I don't know where I got that. His name is Skip Thacker. Sorry about that, Skip. Great guy. Took me on a little tour of the front-end lab. And uh, we had a nice talk about liquid helium. And uh, make sure you check out uh, Matt's uh, latest planetary radio at planetary radio, uh, planetary.org slash radio. Uh, this week and next week, talk, given even more information on his tour. Check out that movie that you can find the link from planetary.org slash radio. Check out my class at planetary.org slash bets class. And check out information about our Shoemaker Neo grant program and all the great stuff uh, that's going on with that. Uh, also at planetary.org, uh, search for Shoemaker or Shoemaker Neo. And don't uh, forget to enter the Space Trivia Contest and catch the random space fact each week from Dr. Bruce Betts. Oh, that is an entertaining segment, isn't it? Yes, you have a chance every week to win some spiffy prize from Planetary Radio t-shirts to uh, Bill Nye's voice on your home answering machine. So uh, check us out. We've got, uh, we've got good stuff. Thank you very much, Bob, for uh, taking the time to join us. Thanks, Matt, for sharing this time with me. As always, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I owe my hat back on for the end here. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> kind of wish you'd worn that the whole time, especially because <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what to do with that, man. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Good night.